Let's start now. So now the recording is in progress. So if you haven't done it, please uh, become a member of our LinkedIn user group and discuss one click LCA together. You have it here. You probably have seen it in the slides. So today we're going to talk about three different standards or certification schemes. Those are climate declaration, the Swedish one, YM, the Finnish one, and NS3720. So first, carbon requirements in the Nordic countries. We have different situation according, um, depending on each country. So in Sweden, the mandatory calculation declaration is from 2022. This is the Swedish climate declaration. They will have carbon footprint limits from 2027. The database is known as Climat Database, and the method is provided by the Swedish Housing Agency, also known as Boverket. In Denmark, this mandatory calculation and declaration of buildings is from 2023, so one year after Sweden. They will have, however, carbon footprint limits already from 2023. The database is exclusively from Okabaudat and the method, as you can see it there, sorry that I cannot say that in Danish. Uh, the Finnish one is mandatory from 2025, as you can see there. It will have limits as well from 2025. The database is there and the method is provided by the Ministry of Environment. Norway has a different situation. The mandatory uh, calculation declaration has been there since 2018, but it's not mandatory for all type of buildings. Um, the same goes with carbon footprint limits since 2018. These two are usually for something called Stots Big Projects or projects that are by um, the Stots Big Organization, uh, institution in Norway. Uh, the database has to be NS3720 compliant data. We will talk about that later. And the method is also known as NS3720. Iceland doesn't have one. Uh, there isn't an, an estimated date of uh, having this mandatory calculation and declaration, so this is still under development. So first we're going to talk about the Swedish one, climate declaration. The basic principles of this one. The law will enter into force on January 1st, 2022. Uh, the basic principle is that all new buildings that are larger than 100 square meters and where a building permit is required must have a climate declaration. Uh, there's only one environmental impact indicator and that's global warming potential. So the climate declaration doesn't have eutrophication, acidification, abiotic depletion, blah, blah, blah. It only has global warming potential. The client is the one that is responsible for the climate declaration uh, being made on time. It's submitted to the national board, and this has to be uh, saved for approximately five years. And the uh, institution responsible for the supervision of this is, as I said before, the National Board of Housing, Building and Planning, also known as Boverket in Sweden. So here you see the, the steps of a project. Sorry that this is in Swedish. This comes from a Vuverket uh, source. But basically, depending on the stage that you are, you need to provide uh, different data to Vuverket. But what we're going to focus on today is the life cycle stages. Again, for those of you that have joined us from the very, very beginning, you are quite familiar by now with the life cycle stages. You know the A1 to A5, B1 to B8, C1 to C4, and D. So climate decoration in Sweden only includes those that are in green here, highlighted in green. So basically product stage A1 to A3 and construction phase A1 to A4 to A5. Those that are highlighted in red are not included in the calculation. So you don't need to calculate the use phase, repair, 
replacement, refurbishment, uh, waste processing, disposal, et cetera, et cetera. This might change from 2027 once we're gonna have carbon limits, but currently from 2022, only A1 to A5. This can be calculated only using two, uh, two types of data. Hoover gets approved data, that is generic data, and also EPDs. So a glance of this, the generic data that I said, Bouverkit's generic data, consists of approximately 171 generic resources. There is a thing regarding these generic resources that you need to know. These generic resources are average of EPDs of certain product category. So for example, um, when I'm gonna uh, do the demo, I'll show you, for example, one generic data source called Concrete C30 from Bouverkit. This Concrete C30 is basically an average of several EPDs of Concrete C30, but this data point has a markup. So to make it simple, let's assume that you can have 10 different EPDs from 10 different manufacturers of Concrete C30. You check the carbon footprint of all of those EPDs. You take an average of that and you say, okay, the average seems to be two kilograms of um, carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of Concrete C30. To that average two kilograms, you add a markup that is 25%. So you will multiply two times 1.25. And that new result that is gonna be three, that's what you're gonna have in your data point. So your data point will say, concrete C30, carbon footprint, three kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of concrete C30. As you can imagine, this top up, this markup, what it does is that on average, if you use these generic data points, you will have higher carbon emissions than if you use an EPD from a manufacturer. This, of course, depends on the manufacturer and so on. But on average, because of this markup, if you use generic data points from Bouverica, you will have higher CO2 emissions. And this is what I'm explaining basically here. So average data times conservative factor that is 1.25 will give you on average higher emissions. Bouverkit did this on purpose. And the reason they did this is because they want to encourage the production or the elaboration of more EPDs. So basically what they want to have is more manufacturers in Sweden making life cycle assessment of their products and eventually having environmental product declarations. So it's to let's say, encourage the uh, production of EPDs in Sweden. So that was basically the very basics of climate decoration. Again, in a nutshell, mandatory from 2022 for all buildings uh, that are uh, larger than 100 square meters and need a permit, just A1 to A5, just a global warming potential, so carbon assessment, and the data points that you can use are either generic from Bouverkit or EPDs, but if you use generic, on average, you will get higher emissions. As simple as that. Then we have the one from Finland, the methodology for assessing the carbon footprint of buildings. Basic principle here is compatible with all building types. So new buildings, refurbishment, uh, movable, temporary, is based on E standards and the level frameworks. And the results can be presented as carbon footprint and carbon handprint. Carbon footprint, I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about, negative climate effects related to the construction project. Carbon handprint is the positive effects that would not occur, occur without the project, usually the D section. So now we have the life cycle stages and you can see that we're seeing something different than the life cycle stages for climate decoration in Sweden. You are seeing more sections highlighted in green. So as you can see here, 
The sections that are not included are B1, B2, B3, and B5, because B5 has a separate assessment for refurbishment. But now we have more sections highlighted in blue. We, we have, in green, sorry. We have replacement B4, this is now included, and we have B6, operational energy use, also included. You are seeing also some sections in blue, A5, C1 to C4, that are also included. Therefore, this methodology is much more comprehensive than the Swedish one. Regarding the carbon handprint, the D section, uh, what is included is this, D1 to D5. There are different benefits uh, because of the construction of this project. And those benefits can be classified as recycling and reuse, basically the emissions avoided through reusing existing structures, materials are, and as energy, uh, when you use materials um, for energy purposes, energy sold out, that is energy created in the building, biogenic carbon, I'm quite familiar, I'm pretty sure you're quite familiar with it, and then uh, cement carbonization, that is carbonization of cementitious materials. Uh, the included building parts for the finished standard uh, are these ones. So we have the building part, so the frame, the envelope, balconies, and so on. Um, I don't need to explain this, but then we have what they call the building site. And the building site is not just external areas as usually, because that's usually what people think when they think of building site, but also the foundation, stabilization, and if applicable, basement. All of those are considered as building site, not as building element, not as just part of the building. Uh, so the inputs, what do you need to input for this um, methodology in a nutshell? The service life, 50 years. Uh, the heated net, uh, net area is from energy certificates. The materials can be quantities from BIM models or planning documents or Excel sheets. Uh, material emissions, uh, 15804A2 compliant EPDs. Um, or Finnish National Database, among others. I'm just gonna show you this uh, later on uh, in the demo. And now we talk, we're gonna talk about the NS3720, the Norwegian one. Basic principles here. Uh, there are some differences versus uh, the Finnish one and the Swedish one. So the foundation's materials are calculated based on the gross floor area of the building they support. The calculation database consists of generic materials and process database in nearly all Norwegian and European EPDs. Please pay attention here. When I say the Swedish one, I said the generic database is the one that is approved by Buverkit. Here we're talking about generic material and process database. We're not saying, for example, generic materials only approved by, etc. Uh, the supported energy norms are Tech 10, Tech 17, and updated to Passive House standards. It also includes B8 operational transport. This, uh, the Norwegian method, includes B8. Before we didn't see that. So, for example, if we go back to the Finnish one, we're not seeing B8 here. We didn't see for. Uh, climate decoration in Sweden, but the Norwegian one does include operational transport. The calculation period we said before for the Finnish one 50 years, the Norwegian one says depends on the project. So if the one who's going to build a building says this building will last for 40 years, the calculation period will be for 40 years. But if it's not defined, it is assumed to be 60 years, not 50 like the Finnish one. Uh, we said that with the Swedish one, only global warming potential is the only impact indicator. Here we have more. We have also non-biogenic carbon, uh, sorry, we have biogenic carbon as well, but we also have land use changes, low look impacts, and all of these must be accounted separately. So in the software, you will have one column for uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, for biogenic carbon, and for land use changes, low look impacts. Uh, the greenhouse 
gas calculations must include emissions from the building site, materials, energy operation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That we can simplify it way better here. So now you see even more sections highlighted in green. Uh, that's because the NS3720 is quite comprehensive in terms of scope. You see that the A1 to A5 is included, same as the Swedish one. Now we're also included uh, replacement, refurbishment, operational energy use, and also the B8 section that I said before. We're now including C3 and C4. And those that are highlighted uh, in orange will be also displayed in the software. The only sections that are not displayed in our software are B2, C1, and C2, because those are not included for NS3720. So that was the very, very basic of these uh, tools. In my opinion, it's way better if you uh, see this, um, the way it works in practice. So we're gonna have now an online demo that I'm gonna show you each of those three tools. So here you have, I created this uh, project already. It's called Demo LCA School Nordics. I'm gonna add those three tools. So the first one, NS3720, the Finnish one, and then I'll add the climate declaration from Sweden. I'm going to call this baseline and I'm just going to click on next. Here, uh, you know that if you want to review the LCA parameters, you can absolutely do so here. And uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to review this and adjust these LCA parameters. I chose this project. This is an office building in Norway. That's why I have here this option. And I'm going to select end of life calculation method as market scenarios adjustable. So I I'm going to be able to uh, select the end of life scenario per material. That is very useful for NS3720 because as I said before, NS3720 does include C3 and C4 sections. So here I have the tools, as you can see. If I click on it, you can clearly see that NS3720 is much more comprehensive than climate decoration. You see the difference here? That's because of the scope. And here you have the Finnish one. So for example, if we go to the Swedish one, let's start with that one because it's the easiest. We can go, for example, to building area. You're quite familiar with this. I select a building area. Sweden will be this, so BTA 2000. Now, when I click uh, building materials, the software already knows that the database for this particular certification is just generic data approved by Beverkit and EPDs. So that's the only thing that I'm going to see here. So when I click, for example, on the arrow and I click on, let's say, glass wool insulation, you see I'm seeing here just EPDs, for example, here generic data, but but approved by Buverkit because I see Buverkit next to the name. And then I'm seeing again, EPDs. So this offer knows that you cannot use generic data that is not approved by Buverkit. So this offer will not display that data. If I wanna do it faster and I just wanna use Buverkit data points, I can simply click here, data source, filter Buverkit. And then I'm gonna click here, and I see different categories, and all of them are genetic data points approved by Buverk. You can see that because next to the name, you see the word Buverk. If you click on the question mark, you can find more information about this, such as description of the product, technical characteristics, among other. If you are using the software in Swedish, this information will be displayed in Swedish. Now, Let's assume that I need actually uh, this rock wool insulation. And the quantity that I need is, for example, 100 square meters. 
The classification system for the Swedish climate declaration is the BSAB83. The software does the classification automatically for you. So the software knows that this is for external walls and therefore selects the category 31, which is walls. If the software does a bad job and for some reason the software selected, let's say, garage, you can just change it yourself manually here. Quite straightforward. If you want to have your own cast custom private classification, uh, you can absolutely do so. That's usually an expert level feature. Um, and for example, if you would like to see the carbon footprint of your building per floor, you can customize this and call it ground floor, first floor, second floor, third floor. And then for example, you say, oh, the rock wool insulation only applies to the second floor and you put it like this. Then at the end in the results page, you can see, for example, the carbon footprint per floor. That can be interesting. But again, this is a custom private classification. You can customize it the way you want it or the way you need it. Transportation distance, this is from the factory to the building side. This is 400 kilometers and the transportation method is like this. This data is again provided by Buverke. They are the ones that are providing the transportation uh, method in this case lorry, uh, Swedish reduction, diesel mix. The software takes this information automatically from the data point, in this case, Buverke, 440. Same goes with wastage during the installation of this uh, material into the building. So the software takes the information automatically from Buverke's data point, in this case, 7%. If I click on save, I'll see the carbon footprint of this Rockwell insulation specifically 100 square meters of rock wool insulation. Okay. Now, if I click on the number here, 0 0.5 tons, if you have an expert license feature level, uh, you can see the calculations. And when I click on see calculations, I see step-by-step, step, why am I getting 0 0.5 tons of CO2 for 100 square meters of rock wool insulation. As you can see here, even you can get the characterization, characterization factor among others. The same goes with different materials. So the same will go if I use an EPD, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I said before that for Swedish climate decoration, you basically have A1 to A5. A5 is uh, classified into different sub-levels in the Swedish climate decoration. So you can have A5-1, A5-2. So that's basically here in the software, construction side operations. So for example, this is the electricity consumption during the construction of the building. This is not while uh, during the operation of the building. So here again, the data is provided by Vuverkid. So here I have electricity, national Swedish mix. And I can input, okay, let's say the construction is gonna last three years. And in total throughout the construction, this will be the electricity consumption. I'm just uh, making this up, of course. So as soon as I click on save, again, I have the data. Now, when I finish with this project, I can click on results. And here I have the result. I have per category that are again, A1 to A5. This is what you're seeing here. The A5 is divided into subsections, as I said before. Basically, those are the electricity use on the side during the construction phase and the wastage during the installation of the materials into the building. Um, the only environmental impact indicator, again, global warming potential. That's the only thing that you're gonna see here. And if you wanna see this with details, you can simply click on details and I see, okay, why do I have these impacts? Okay, uh, it's because of the rockwell insulation. The same goes, for example, with any of these. Now, remember that I said before, the Buverkit data comes with a market. That is 1.25. If you would like to see what would be the results without that markup, you have this subsection here. There's additional results with average values for Buverke. And that's why you are not seeing the exact same result here 
as here, because basically here you're seeing results without the mark. Another information that you can get here is uh, how much of your global warming potential comes from Bouverk data and how much from EPD data. Until now, I selected just rock wool insulation from Bouverkit. That's why it says that 100% of the impact come from Bouverkit data points. It's 0% from EPDs, straightforward. The software also creates a list of most contributing materials. Uh, uh, this is cradle to gate impact, so just A1 to A3 impacts. So it doesn't take into consideration transportation distance from the factory to the building site or the waste stage or end of life scenario of the material. No, no, no. It's just cradle to gate impacts. Rock wool insulation is the only one. That's why I only see one. And it's causing 100% of the impacts in this project, uh, cradle to gate impacts, because it, once again, this is the only uh, product that I selected. The software will provide with uh, sustainable alternatives in case you're using EPDs, in case you're using a uh, very good data point, the software will not provide, um, will provide actually, I see here also with uh, sustainable alternatives, but will it cannot show you the uh, ranking of this uh, generic data point. So I don't know if you have tried out before the ranking, uh, feature, but basically the way the ranking feature works is that what you're seeing here is carbon intensity. The software makes a ranking of certain product categories. So for example, rock wool insulation from the best product in terms of CO2 emissions, cradle to gate, A1 to A3, to the worst product, A1 to A3 impacts. And that ranking, if I click on here, C4 ranking, this is an uh, expert feature as well. I can see the best product in the market for rock wool insulation. Again, A1 to A3 impacts. So here I see that the best one is one in Finland, the second best one in Lithuania, et cetera. So, so if I want to optimize my project here in Sweden, what, what I can do is the following. I could unclick all of the flags here until I only have the Swedish flag. And then of course I will know the best one in Sweden. Or the second option that I have is I click here, show all, and I'm gonna have it in a table format. And I can see the best product in Sweden, A1 to A3 impacts for rock wool insulation, for example. I simply scroll down and eventually I'll find one and here it is. Now I know that this one is the best in Sweden. This is very useful uh, because remember that in climate decoration in Sweden, you're just considering A1 to A5. So if a material is actually better from A1 to A3, that's quite beneficial. But as you might know already, it can happen in real life that I see this and you can tell me, but Fernando, we have a problem. My project, my building site is, for example, in Gothenburg. And I know that this manufacturer, Parab, is in Uppsala. So that's quite far away. So what about using a different product from a different manufacturer that I know A1 to A3 impacts will be worse because I'm seeing it here in your software, but this manufacturer is quite close to the building site. So would the transport affect the overall result from A1 to A5? And there's actually a way to check that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select that one, Parrot, I'm gonna copy this. And what I'm gonna do is I'll go to the front page And I'm going to click on compare data. Now I'm going to copy and paste this Rockwell installation from Para. That now it says this one. Let's just select this one. And I'm going to select 
I'm not a manufacturer from Sweden. And let's say rock wool or stone wool instead. So let's assume this is also uh, in Sweden, just to, for the purpose of this demo. Okay, so now I know that this one, the first one is better than this one in A A1 to A3 impacts. I know it, I saw the ranking, I know this is better, but we have a problem. This one, the first one that I'm gonna use 100 square meters versus 100 square meters. Let's compare apples to apples. I know that this one is quite far away. It's 475 kilometers away. The transportation method, I'm gonna send this one a trailer combination. Uh, and for the second one, this is quite close. Not like extremely close, but let's say 95 kilometers away. I'm gonna assume the same transportation method for both of them. I'm gonna assume the serve, same service life, same end of life process, etc. I just wanna see if this product from Parag is still better than the second one uh, in spite of the transportation distance, the longer transportation distance. So I'm gonna click on save and now we can see if that's the case or not. And in this particular case, this is still better, as you can see, 0 0.15. This is the total result, and this is 1.5 tons. So as we can see here, even though the transportation is, uh, is different for this and this, uh, overall, this is still a better option. But this is more or less the way that you need to think when you want to select different materials. The ranking can give you a good estimate to see more or less what product is better. But remember that that ranking is just created to gate impacts and you have to take into consideration other things. And the things that you need to take into consideration depends on the certification that you're working with. So if you work with climate decoration in Sweden, you know that the scope is A1 to A5. So you also need to take into consideration A4 and A5. But if you're working with a Norwegian one, this scope is much more comprehensive. So there are other things that you need to take into account such as, for example, the replacement. So if we go to the Norwegian one, I'm gonna select a building area again. So now we're not using the Swedish, Swedish one, we're using this one, Let's select that one. Calculation period, you saw before, uh, if it's, not provided by the one who's going to build a building, we assume 60 years. So let's stick with 60 years. You are seeing uh, way more sections here above because of the scope. So the building materials, now you are seeing also more sections. I'm gonna explain one by one. So let's let's select uh, one material, so concrete. As you might know already, the software always displays local data first. So here I'm seeing local generic data and then local manufacturer specific data. So EPDs, local EPDs. So let's go with one of them. So I'm just going to take this one from Sanders Beton. And let's say I need 25 cubic meters. Part of the building, this is a different one. Before, for the Swedish one, we had the BSAB83 uh, classification. Now we have a different classification, but more or less, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about classifying materials according to the part of the building they belong to. Uh, and in this case, the classification says also external walls. The software does it automatically for you. Transportation distance, 70 kilometers. This is average for the Nordics from the factory to the building site. Transportation method, average for the material chosen. In this case, concrete. That's why we have a concrete mixer truck. The software does it automatically. Service life as building. So in this case, uh, 60 years. 
Now we have wastage, same as before. This, uh, this is 4% according to the material, in this case, concrete. But now we have three, four different columns that we didn't see before. First, we see repair per year, B3 section. Uh, this is the percentage of repair works that we're having per year. The software provides an example here. So it says um, if you have an annual repair rate of certain broken windows, so if one window out of 10 breaks every five years, an appropriate annual repair rate is 2%. It sounds a bit complicated, but with practice, you kind of uh, get how to do this calculation. In this case, it says none. If that's not the case, you can change it manually. Now, at the beginning, if you remember, I chose uh, to review the LCA parameters and I went to one section called end of life scenario. And the first option that was there was material locked. That's the predefined option. But I changed that and I chose market scenarios beta. Market scenarios basically allows you to select the end of life process of each material. The software will give you predefined options according to the material that you're working with. So in this case, I'm working with concrete, ready mix concrete to be more precise. So the software gives me three different options, concrete crash to aggregate, or the concrete will go to landfills. If I choose something different, so for example, let's select timber or CLT, let's select CLT. Now the options are different. I have wood incineration or wood that will go to landfill or we will reuse the CLT. Uh, or use the end of life scenario as defined in the EPD. So for example, I'm gonna say wood incineration. So when you select market scenarios, you are capable of choosing the end of life process. If you select material locked or you just work with the predefined option, the software will choose the end of life scenario for you, uh, choosing the most typical end of life scenario for that material. So keep that in mind. Again, as I said before, if for certain uh, schemes or certification, that doesn't really matter. So if you're working for climate creation in Sweden, it doesn't matter if you select material lock or market scenarios because the end of life process is not calculated. So it doesn't really matter. But for the Norwegian one, for example, this is important. So um, you might need to pay attention whether you would like to choose the end of life scenario yourself or uh, it's fine if the software does it for you. Uh, there is a column also called EPD. This is basically, if you're using an EPD, you can um, click this. This is for calculation purposes that I'll show you later. And then if this is a reused material, so you're not buying new material, you're not buying from a supplier that needs to produce this material, manufacture and then send it. If that's not the case, if you're reusing material from a previous project, you can unclick, you can click this column here. And then you click on save. And as I said before, the software will calculate the life cycle assessment of these materials. Now, there are different sections here. So now we have one called energy consumption. This is not the same as the Swedish one. This is related to the, uh, once the building is in operation phase, so one can use the building. So the first one says consumption of grid electricity and all the figures that you need to provide here are on an annual basis. So please pay attention to that. So here, for example, I can I have different options. Uh, I have either three year average, three year average, or sixty years uh, forecast average. So I'm going to select, for example, this one. I'm not going to go into detail uh, of each uh, of the electricity profiles. So let's assume that my building, according to my energy modulations and so on will have an electricity consumption of 
this per year. And here I have, you can do this uh, just for the overall consumption per year, which is here. Or if you would like to have this um, per usage, you can simply go here, copy this many, multiple times. Not like that, like this. And then you can change and say, this is for the facility. This is for heating. This is for cooling. And this is, for example, for hot water. And then you can classify like this. So you know that this will be like this, like this, like this, and let's say like this, instead of having just overall. And if you want to be even more precise, you can just write comments here. That will help you understand why do you have these numbers. Um, there are some other subsections called uh, fuel demand stationary units. So basically this is fuel for backup power generators. So if the backup power generator, if you have them, of course, uh, and they run on diesel, you select diesel and let's say this is what they need, 12 liters. And that's basically what you put there. Uh, then we have, another section called emissions and removals. Here you have three subsections. The first one is refrigerants. Very straightforward. This is refrigerant leakages. So you can assume you have a building, let's say an office building, you have several ACs. Each of them, of course, need refrigerant. You, what your input here, uh, input in here is basically the type of refrigerant. So let's say, you have this, and then you know, okay, I have 10 ACs, each of them need, let's say one kilo of refrigerant, so I have 10 kilos, basically. This is the average service life, 25 years, and this is the annual leakage rate uh, here and here. It's quite straightforward. Uh, vegetation, carbon withdrawals, basically, if you have vegetation or landscaping during the project's lifetime, uh, and basically the data set or the data points that you're gonna be, that you're gonna see here are related to types of trees. So I am not a tree expert. So I'm just gonna choose the first one that I see here. And here you need to input this in units. So we're gonna have 14 of these, for example. Carbonization of cementitious uh, materials. Uh, as you might know, uh, Elements such as concrete, cement, mortar, they absorb carbon dioxide when exposed to air. And that's basically what we're going to uh, put here. As you are seeing, each of these sections, they always provide specific data points. And they provide data points related to this section. So in this section, you're not seeing, for example, bricks uh, or um, stone, uh, rock wool insulation, et cetera. No, because this offer knows that this section is carbonization of cementitious materials, and that's what you need to input here. The same goes with vegetation. You're only gonna see trees. And the same for refrigerants, you will only see refrigerants. So this offer customize the data points according to the section. Operational transport, this is a new one. This is the B8 section. This is um, quite unique of uh, NS3720. So basically in operational transport, we're talking about the transport uh, to the building site once the building is in operation. We have different subsections here. This, this section can be a bit complicated because you need to define uh, many factors first, such as the annual opening days of the building. So here, for example, the option is that the building will be open 300 days per year. Uh, you can define also the annual visitor travel days, the parking availability factor. If the building has a parking lot, you can also define here if the parking is usually full, half full, empty, et cetera, et cetera and some other aspects such as the average trip length for goods transport uh, or goods transport factor. 
as can be seen here, because remember, once the building is in operation, you have transport of people that go to the building, for example, to work, but you also have transport of goods to the building. Um, you can also define different emission factors here for uh, car pulling, bus trips, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you wanna make it uh, loaded, according to different regions, you can absolutely do so. We have predefined options. So for example, if this building is gonna be built in Drummond, as can be seen here, I can simply select Drummond city area and then load transport modes. And the software will get the typical values for the city of Drummond. The same goes uh, for Oslo, Bergen, Trondheim, and different Norwegian cities, as can be seen here. Finally, I'm just gonna select the additional scenarios that can be seen here. And this is uh, according to one chapter, if there is additional alternative transport scenarios that my change, you can customize it here. For example, the buses uh, will be, um, will run on biofuel or will be electrical, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not gonna uh, go deep into this topic because it's a bit complicated. Uh, so if you remember from my slide, I said that the NS3720 requires you to classify your results on um, by global warming potential, biogenic carbon, and LULUC impact. And that's why we have these three different columns here. The uh, life cycle stages are here on the left. You are seeing way more than before because of the comprehensive scope. And the NS3720 also asked to provide global warming potential impacts per year or per square meter or per square meter per year, for example, like this. And that's why you have more denominators here, as you can see. But the rest is pretty much the same. You always get the graphs according to classifications and life cycle stages and resource type, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this one, you can always customize into a bar chart or a column or a tree map. And remember that you can always download this either as, an, uh, as a picture or Excel file, and later on, you can change the colors if you need to. The same goes with the bubbles in Sankey and TreeMap, among other. Now, what I wanna show you with the finished one is uh, a way to do this faster when it comes to building materials. So let's say now, uh, you will start uh, this world into the um, doing LCA calculations, for example. And you know that with our software, you can use integration with Revit, you can do it manually, you can use integration with Tecla. And now let's say you have to do this calculation. Uh, another thing that you can do if you know that you're gonna have uh, a type of construction quite often, because whether this is very common in Finland, Norway, Sweden, etc., is the possibility of creating groups. So for example, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna select concrete. Again, we're gonna see first Norwegian options because I said that this project is located in Norway. That's why we're seeing this. And I'm gonna select this one. And then I'm gonna select also EPS insulation. And I'm just selecting the first thing that I see. So let's say that this is quite common, let's say in Finland. Uh, so I know that I'm gonna use this in several projects. So in order to save time, what I can do is I can simply create a group And I'm gonna call this, this the way my company calls it internally. So let's say we call this as an internal wall six. And I know that in order to make one square meter of this wall, I need 
one square meter of this and 0 0.932 of this. And then I simply gonna drag and drop and I'm gonna drag and drop again. This, I'm gonna say that this is an internal wall construction. I could add the comment that I want to, and then I can save this for my organization. If I do so, this means that in all of my projects, for now, I'm just gonna save it here. But if I save it in my organization, I can use this private construction in all of my projects. So next time that I have a project that I know we're gonna have once again, the typical internal wall six, instead of searching for concrete and EPS insulation, I could, will simply go here and type the word, uh, not that one, internal wall six, and this will show up. And because this is a construction, when I change the quantities here, you can see the quantities below also change. And that can help you save a lot of time. Now I'm gonna click on save and you will see the carbon footprint of this construction. And here we have 23 tons, that's the, for the construction, but if I click here, I can see for each element, as you are seeing here. The sections uh, are exactly the same as with the NS3720. Uh, I mean, we're seeing less because we're not seeing, for example, uh, the operational transport B8 and emissions and removal here is only carbonization of cementitious uh, materials. Uh, we're not seeing, again, vegetation or uh, refrigerants leakage uh, here for the finished one. But then in the results, we're gonna see this one customized to the Finnish standard here. And what we're seeing different here is the D module that remember was the carbon handprint, the benefits, uh, they are listed here below as a negative, uh, in negative values. That's the difference. Then again, this and this, everything exactly as uh, before. Finally, what I wanted to show you before uh, answering your questions is that in general for NS3720, the Norwegian one, you have to compare your LCA results versus a reference building. That is quite common. The reference building, you, you do it using Carbon Designer. Uh, probably you have seen already how you can do that, uh, how you can create one using Carbon Designer. In the same way it goes for NS3720. So for example, I'm gonna create one and I'm gonna call it reference building. So again, I design, then I added one. So I'm, I'll go here, carbon designer, create baseline. And now I have the Norwegian reference building because this will be for NS3720. This is an office building. And I know that this was 2000 square meters, let's say four floors above the ground. And I said 60 years as calculation period. When I click on calculate areas, here I have typical areas of an office building in Norway, according to Statsvik specifications. I can customize this so I can say, well, this office will have no balconies and the windows will be like this. The geometry of the building, you're seeing it here, is kind of like a shoebox. That's the shape of the building, but I can still customize aspects such as the height, the width, and depth. If I know already that my baseline scenario will be, for example, concrete precast. So we're gonna use concrete precast for several elements. I can already choose here. Otherwise, the same goes with wood, but if I don't, I can simply select not applied and then create baseline. The software will create, uh, will calculate the life cycle assessment of a typical Norwegian office building, 2000 square meters, four floors above the ground using typical construction materials in that market. 
I can check all of those construction materials per part of the building later on, and I can make changes uh, manually or by selecting predefined scenarios that I'm gonna show you soon once the calculation is done. So here we have, this is the result, 317 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square meter. The ground floor, 77 tons, floor slabs, 115 tons, beams, et cetera, et cetera. So this looks great, but I want to know what exactly is inside my building. So the way to do that is I click here, cross insulation, CPS, columns. I have 80% of steel columns and 20% concrete columns. External walls, I have 70% of timber frame, 10% of LECA, and 20% of concrete external wall, et cetera, et cetera. As I said before, if I want to change one of these, so let me see. let's see, I want to change the frost insulation. We're gonna use this one. I simply click on it, and then I the software will recalculate this and here I see the effect of this decision. Now I have minus 0.2 tons of CO2. The same goes here. For example, internal walls, I have 60% of this now, but what if I have, for example, like this. And you can see, Another option is to use predefined options, so scenarios. Basically, now I say, okay, what if the building is made of wood? And I click on yes, and the software, once again, will recalculate this, and I'll see the effect of these changes. If I'm satisfied with this option, and let's say uh, I'm happy with, or not really happy, but let's say this reference building is really uh, similar to the building that, that we're going to build, um, then I can save this. Uh, I can set this as my baseline building and then save it. So let's assume this is actually the case. So I already check row by row and I say like, yes, this is more or less what we're going to do. So I'm going to set this as baseline and I'm going to save this design to query. Now, the software will make once again a life cycle assessment of this building, taking into account these materials and taking into account the scope. So if I use, for example, Carbon Designer for the Swedish climate declaration, the software will do a life cycle assessment considering A1 to A5. But if I do it for NS3720, more things will be taken into account, such as, for example, the repair or end of life scenario, as you can see here. And now this is my reference building. I can see the results for this. And this is my reference building, 365 tons of CO2. And now if I wanna compare this, with the first design that I made, the baseline, I click on compare designs, and here I can see the difference. Of course, we're seeing ridiculous numbers because this is just, uh, my baseline was just a demo project with one or two materials, basically. But that's why. But this is how you can compare uh, projects. That's, I mean, your project versus the reference building and see if you're actually achieving reductions or not. And remember that once you have more than two designs completed, the software will automatically create graphs for you, comparison graphs, as you can see here below. So that was uh, more or less it regarding these uh, standards. Now you know the basics of them. Now you know what's included, what's the scope, the environmental impact indicators. Um, you know that uh, they are mandatory from 
let's say the Swedish from 2022, the Finnish 2025, the Norwegian one from 2018, um, the, for different types of buildings, depending on the size. Um, and now you know how to do calculations using one click LCA. That was uh, pretty much it from my side. So now we can move to the Q&A section. So I'll go to Q and A. Uh, what do you mean by saving for five years, keeping in the record? Yes, keeping in the record. That's exactly what I meant. Uh, we will have a group photo for together with all the summer school participants and teachers. I, I I don't know about that. Uh, then let me see. Okay, uh, Sean is answering Mitya Hokkanen. Uh, what else? Well, really good question uh, from the anonymous uh, attendee regarding why countries are different, uh, choosing uh, different scopes. Um, there might be different reasons for that, like uh, data availability uh, uh, among others. But I can tell you that in, in Sweden, there are certain groups that are not quite happy with, uh, their, with the decision of just choosing A1 to A5. Uh, they don't understand why uh, they have, Sweden is gonna wait five years to define uh, carbon footprint limits of buildings and why the, the scope is so limited. Um, so I cannot really give you a, a, an answer. Okay, the reason is this and this and this. I'm pretty sure there are different reasons of why they're choosing uh, different scopes. Uh, but uh, in my personal opinion, this is not the, the company's uh, opinion. Um, I, I do believe that scopes such as A1 to A5 and excluding many different uh, aspects um, is very, very limited. And uh, the approach should be a much more comprehensive LCA with uh, uh, setting carbon fo uh, footprint limits on buildings, different types of buildings. Um, then what else do we have in the chat? I think Auntie is also already answering questions. Someone asked for the link of the exam. I'm not responsible for that one for sure. Uh, okay. Mm, good, good uh, comment from Andrea. Yeah, the French one as well, really good comment. And yes, I see that many of my colleagues. Uh, then Marina is asking, there was hardly LCC considered simultaneously with LCA in the summer school. Is this, uh, uh, is this the industry practice too? Well, I can tell you Marina from my experience, I have, more than a hundred customers, uh, I would say that probably less than 10% is doing LCC simultaneously with LCA. So um, I, I, again, I, I wouldn't say it's uh, completely uh, uncommon or strange, but that definitely it's not something that you see often. Um, at least again, I work with mainly with Nordic companies and I do have some customers that are doing LCC with LCA, but I would say that's not, I wouldn't say like nine out of 10 are doing LCC with LCA. I would say either, even less than two out of 10. Yeah, 
Yeah, and then the cost is a crucial part of choosing materials. So actually, Marina, um, if you if we go again here, I'll show you regarding the cost that you're asking. Uh, we also understand that cost is a crucial part because it's not just uh, choosing sometimes the environmental, uh, the most environmental friendly material or something like that, but also cost matters. Uh, that's why if you are gonna use the compare data function, you can first set here the cost. And you do that by clicking on parameters, then LCC parameters, and then you select the region. So let's assume that this project is in Norway. As I said before, I'm gonna click on load regional cost parameters. Then I select the currency and then the applicable exchange rate. That is more or less like this right now. Okay, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna save this. And now when I go to compare data function and I click on edit the data, if I want to compare different materials here, you see at the beginning, it says unit cost. For some reason, didn't allow me to define the LCC parameters. I couldn't save it. Ah, I didn't save it. Sorry, my bad there. Let's do it again. So Norway, knock, save. And now when I go to compare data function, and I want to analyze different options for materials, you see now you have the unit cost here. So let's imagine, for example, that this one is actually 200 uh, Norwegian crowns per square meter, and this is, let's say, 75. So this would be the total cost, 20,000 Norwegian crowns, and this will be 7,000 Norwegian crowns. So now you know that this one is environmentally better, but considerably more expensive. And another way that we tackle this issue is by uh, is with our LCC tool. We have an LCC tool is an add-on that you can add to uh, all of your projects actually. So for example, if you have it available, you can simply go to tools, then you select lifecycle costs, then you click on save, you need to define again the LCC parameters of whether this is project is in Norway, Sweden, et cetera, et cetera. But once you define it, basically here, when I go to the building query, materials query, sorry. Now you see next to each material, you have the unit cost and you have also the total cost. At the same time, you can add different costs such as capital costs of the uh, purchase of the land or, um, infrastructure or permit licenses and so on. And at the same time, you can also add operating costs such as maintenance or uh, cleaning or security services, repairmen, uh, among others. So it's the same um, as the LCA tool. You see the global, um, sorry, the carbon footprint. Now you will see, for example, the costs. So does our student license allow us to look at LCC? Uh, I'm not familiar with that, sorry that I cannot answer. Uh, what else? Do we have anything in the chat? Not really. Good question from uh, Daria. Uh, Norway's uh, regulation enforced in 2018. Do you think that there are enough professionals available to do LCAs in Norway to cover uh, the demand? Uh, we have 
several customers in Norway, but I'm pretty sure that we're not um, uh, covering all of them. So I'm quite sure that the, the, um, the market needs more professionals in Norway. In fact, recently in Norway, um, now for projects, I think above 200 million Norwegian crowns, I'm talking about infrastructure projects, uh, they require SQL certification, which is infrastructure. You can do also infrastructure LCA for SQL. So I'm pretty sure that Norway still needs more professionals to do LCA to cover the demand. And then also is Norway the only country which has a detailed, detailed description of the building of the baseline uh, building? Um, I cannot say globally if it's the only one. I'm not familiar with all other certifications or schemes such as uh, the French one. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Um, so I cannot really say that uh, globally, maybe my colleagues here like Auntie or Sean can, can answer this question. Um, yeah, so for example, the French regulation does not require a baseline. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with the French regulation at all. But among the, the Nordics, yes, I would say the Norwegian one is uh, quite detailed in, turn of, uh, in terms of baseline. Because as I said before, for the Swedish one, for example, there, there is no baseline and we won't have one until 2027. Um, the question regarding other uh, tools, well, uh, probably you're quite familiar with uh, Sima Pro, Gabi, uh, those are uh, other LCA software. Um, then Sweden also has a BM uh, for the climate integration, although with, uh, that doesn't allow integration with other software, the database is quite limited. Um, not as user friendly as one click, but yeah, you have, as I said before, Sima Pro, Gabi, BM, among others. Um, regarding the, the question of uh, the, at what stage uh, these uh, reportings are expected, um, it's, you have to have, let's say, reports uh, per different stages, including the one right before handover. That's regarding the, the Swedish um, climate declaration. That is actually... I'll show you. This one is described in this picture. Here, that's sorry, that is in Swedish. I don't know if you can read Swedish. 
but this is what is described here regarding the um, stages. Otherwise, uh, if you don't read Swedish, but you would like to know more about it, you can just check Buverket online. And then uh, you can see the, the requirements regarding the stages and uh, what do you need to present. Um, and also, also uh, speaking of climate integration, uh, we're going to have a webinar on Tuesday at 11 a.m. Swedish time. So for those of you that are interested in the Swedish climate integration, we're going to have a webinar at 11 uh, next Tuesday, but the webinar is going to be 100% in Swedish. My colleague Eric Larsson is going to um, lead that webinar. You can find more information on our LinkedIn page. Will the webinar be recorded? Yes, the webinar is recorded. It's being recorded. Okay, I think we're running out of questions. If there will be any webinars on the, uh, about the French one, I think we had one uh, recently. So, uh, what I suggest is uh, try to contact uh, maybe support, uh, you know, support at oneclickLCA.com uh, because I'm pretty sure we recently had a webinar. So maybe you can have access to the recordings. Uh, so please contact support. They can definitely help you. Okay, Auntie is answering some questions. So I'm gonna leave the first two questions to my colleagues because I don't really have a proper answer for that. And for the French, they already answered in the chat. Uh, so the last question is, uh, if we're going to have, uh, something similar to the summer school, uh, to be honest with you, I have no idea. Uh, I'm <laughs> not in charge of that. Uh, this is the first time we try this out. Uh, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's been quite, quite good, quite successful. Um, but again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in charge of this. So, um, but just uh, stay tuned. I mean, uh, you can um, check our newsletter if, in case you haven't um, done that yet. Try to do it so you can get um, notifications uh, about it and, and so on. So, uh, my colleagues are answering the last questions. So. Uh, to follow uh, us, uh, the best thing that you can do is to follow us on LinkedIn for details about upcoming webinars, upcoming uh, conferences or courses or trainings, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is the last session. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for those of you that have uh, joined us from the very, very beginning. It's been a pleasure. Um, I hope to um, see you maybe soon maybe you will start working as professionals in the lca world uh that would be great so stay tuned follow us on linkedin uh subscribe to our newsletter newsletter and thank you thank you so much have a great rest of the day and see you soon bye bye <laughs>